Our speaker today is Mary Beth Fueling. Mary Beth is an advanced practice dietitian in the Quality Improvement and Research Department at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. Mary Beth is a frequent speaker at conferences around the country and a member of FAIR's Education Working Group. Without further ado, I will turn the program over to Mary Beth. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd first like to thank Mike and all of FAIR for this opportunity to share this information with you today. M managing food allergies is absolutely um, a balancing act with nutrition and is a challenging role that we all um, need to take into consideration. So today we will t first define and review nutrition needs and then we'll take a look at how the removal of food allergies impacts nutrition. We'll briefly review how a registered dietitian can help and most importantly identify practical tips for ensuring adequate nutrition and intake. How do you determine your or your child's nutrition needs when you have a food allergy? You must step carefully in order to avoid nutrition deficiencies. So let's take a look. First, nutrition. When you hear that word, what does it mean? To those with food allergy, it often means concern that you or your child is missing out on something very important. When we take a look at what nutrition actually is, nutrition is taking in and the utilization of food and liquids that lead to growth, repair, and maintenance of the body. This involves ingestion, digestion, absorption, and assimilation. Good nutrition can help prevent disease and promote health. There are six categories that are required. This includes protein, carbohydrate, fat, fibers, vitamins, minerals, and water. Let's take a look, moment to look more practically about what nutrition means for children. With adequate nutrition, children will experience healthy growth and appear well-nourished. It's also important to review the nutrition principles for children. First, we know that all children require the same nutrients for growth, development, and health. Secondly, children with special needs may require more or less of very specific nutrients. Nutrients can be adequately provided with a variety of different feeding plans. And finally, we must focus on key nutrients to decrease risk of nutrition-related problems. What are the growth and weight goals for children and adults? Children must be plotted on an age-appropriate growth chart and monitored over time. Following the growth curve and BMI curve is an indicator for children for nutrition status. With adults, they should maintain a healthy weight by using the body mass index with a goal of 18.5 to 24.9. Again, this is one indicator of nutrition status. In addition to weight and growth, nutrition distribution and intake is the second indicator of nutrition status and extremely important. A child, um, a child may gain weight but could be malnourished due to the type of calories they are consuming. This, is increase, this increases the risk when elimin, is increased risk when eliminating foods from the diet. Therefore, we must review the plate to help everyone understand what are the required nutrients. Anytime one or more food groups is avoided, there is increased risk for inadequate nutrition intake. If we understand what each of the food groups provide, it helps us with identifying what the risks are and how to substitute or supplement for what, we must, what must be avoided for food allergy. Let's take a list, look at the list of the food groups. It includes grains, vegetables, fruits, dairy, and protein. As we move forward with our discussion today, we're going to take a look at what each of these food groups provide nutritionally. 
When we take a look at grains, one of the most important nutrients is fiber. This is important for proper bowel function and provide, provide a feeling of fullness with fewer calories. Grains also provide many different types of B vitamins. They play a key role in metabolism and are essential for a healthy nervous system. Folate is another B vitamin that helps the body form red blood cells. When we take a look at vegetables, vegetables are naturally low in sodium, fat, and calories. They also provide a great source of potassium from many different vegetables. You can see the list here includes potatoes, tomatoes, beans, spinach, lentils, and kidney beans. Vegetables are also a very important source of fiber, and this helps reduce blood cholesterol levels, helps with proper bowel function, as well as the feeling of fullness with fewer calories. Vegetables are also an important source of folate, and they provide two additional vitamins. Vitamin A, which keeps the eyes and skin healthy and helps us protect against infections, and vitamin C, which helps heal cuts and wounds, keeps teeth and gums healthy, and aids in the absorption of iron. The next food group is fruits. When we take a look at fruits, they too are naturally low in fat and sodium and calories. Fruits also are a great source of potassium from bananas, peaches and apricots, orange juice are just some examples. Fruits also are a great source of fiber, but we need to remember that the fiber will only come in the form of the whole fruit or the cut up fruit. If someone is consuming juice from fruit from juices, they typically are receiving little to no fiber and miss out on the benefit. <coughs> Vitamin C is also an important source from fruits, which again helps with growth and repair of all the body tissues, helps heal cuts and wounds, and helps for healthy teeth and gums. Finally, fruit is also another important source of folate, which helps form our red blood cells. Next is this important group of dairy. Dairy is an extremely important food group that includes nutrients that may not be provided from other food groups. This includes calcium, which helps with building strong bones and teeth and maintaining bone mass. Milk is also a significant source of potassium. And potassium, in addition to the other things previously mentioned, also helps maintain a healthy blood pressure. Dairy also is our source for vitamin D. Vitamin D functions in the body to maintain proper levels of calcium and phosphorus to build healthy bones. Fat is another very important nutrient from the dairy and milk group. Milk products are providing an essential source for fat, and if they are consumed in their low-fat or fat-free form, then they provide minimal fat. It's important to remember that we can safely replace dairy and milk with a combination of food, beverages, and nutritional supplements. We'll expand on that a little bit later. Protein. Protein is just one of the great food groups that really is helping us out in the world of food allergy. Protein provides lots of nutrition from lots of different areas, and protein provides uh, besides the protein, B vitamins, vitamin E, iron, zinc, and magnesium. Protein also functions as the building blocks for bones, muscles, cartilage, skin, and blood. Building blocks for enzymes, hormones, and vitamins. And protein is providing calories. With the B vitamins, this has helped release energy and plays a vital role in the function of the nervous system. Iron is used to carry the oxygen in the blood, and magnesium is used in building bones and releasing energy from muscles. Lastly, zinc is a necessary nutrient for biochemical reactions and helps the immune system function properly. I have taken liberty to add in one additional food group from, that's not included with my plate, and it's the nutrient of oils and fats. 
We need to remember that we need to have a good source of fat in our diet. It's needed for good health. This oils provide a source of essential fatty acids, which is required. It also provides a source of vitamin E. But just remember, oils still contain calories. So we need to balance getting in enough, but not too much. Now that we have reviewed the nutrients we need, let's take a look at how the diagnosis of food allergy impacts nutrition. If we understand what is avoided, it will help determine what nutrition goals need to be set to meet nutrition needs for that individual person. Food allergies and nutrition. Research tells us that a restricted diet absolutely will affect the nutrient intake and increases the risk of nutrition deficiencies and poor growth. We know that providing the needs are challenging and will increase stress. It is critical to have nutrition monitoring and it's important to continue to have ongoing education. Always remember, increased number of food allergies means increased nutrition risk. So what are the food, major food allergens? Let's take a moment to go through each one, one by one. First, milk provides a good source of many nutrients essential for bone mineralization and growth. Eggs provide a source of quality protein as well as many other micronutrients you or your child will still easily get an adequate amount of proteins when egg must be eliminated if he or she is not allergic to other protein sources such as milk, meat, poultry, fish, nuts, and legumes. Soybeans provide one of the highest quality proteins in the diet. If you emphasize eating a variety of fruits, vegetables, enriched in fortified grains and tolerated other sources of protein such um, and are able to tolerate other sources of protein, restricting soy in the diet will pose less of a nutritional risk. Peanuts and tree nuts are a good source of protein in the diet. However, those who avoid nuts of all types should not be at nutritional risk since there are many other sources of protein. Fish and shellfish. Fish is another good source of protein. If you must avoid fish, you can find the same nutrients in other protein sources such as meats, grains, and legumes. Finally, the eighth allergen, wheat. Grains contain a variable amounts of protein, a source of carbohydrate when fortified, and a good variety of vitamins and minerals. You can substitute flours for alternative grains to provide the same nutrients as wheat. However, you must choose alternatives carefully as many are not fortified. Another reminder is that eight foods cause 90% of the allergic reactions in the United States. So research also tells us that at least 25% will have a vitamin and mineral deficiency if they're avoiding foods for food allergies. We know that it impacts the macronutrients, the amounts of calories, protein, carbohydrate, and fat, but it varies depending on the combination of allergens that are being avoided. We also know that risk increases with additional problems of picky eating, feeding difficulties such as delayed advance of diet, any social or environmental concerns that are impacting eating, anytime there's poor growth or underweight, and or if there's any financial concerns. Someone recently told me that they were voluntarily removing milk and egg wheat from their diet. And they commented to me that they would expect to have symptoms if they were missing out on any nutrients. Otherwise, they felt that they would be just fine. Unfortunately, if symptoms are present, this is a sign of severe deficiency. It is important to realize that with careful meal planning, these health risks can be avoided even with the severely restricted diet. So some of the health risks 
of poor nutrition are the following. If we don't get in enough calories, we can, that can lead to malnutrition. Inadequate protein leads to low muscle mass and poor immune function. Inadequate fat leads to essential fatty acid deficiency. Inadequate iron results in anemia and poor endurance. Inadequate calcium and vitamin D have significant impact on our bones. Zinc, vitamin A, C, and E will result in poor wound healing. Inadequate zinc also leads to altered taste and potentially poor appetite. And vitamin K is critical for poor blood clot to avoid poor blood clotting. So keep in mind that we don't want to wait for deficiencies to show up as symptoms, but we need to be proactive in planning for adequate nutrient intake. Earlier this afternoon, we reviewed the nutrition that each of the eight common food allergies provide. This slide offers alternative substitutions for the avoided food. You will notice there is a common link. Meat and legumes provide many of the missing micronutrients and may need to be increased in the diet. For example, milk, when that's removed, it can be a lot of the nutrition can be made up from eating meats, legumes, whole grains, nuts, mushrooms, fortified foods and beverages, fish, bright and yellow orange vegetables. Soy, we can include if we avoid um, the substitutions can be meats, legumes, enriched whole grain bread products, eggs, nuts, peas, seeds, milk, and dried fruit. Wheat, we can find lots of alternative fortified grains, soy, legumes, egg, milk, nuts, seed, apples, banana, spinach, and potatoes. The second slide browns out the rest of the food most common food allergies. Unfortunately, often children that are newly diagnosed are young children that may or may not eat meat or some of the other textures well. So you might need to prepare the meat or some of the other foods in alternate forms as a way for, to make it easier for them to eat if they have not yet mastered all of their feeding and chewing skills. Feeding skills must be considered when making substitutions. To help us better understand how the removal of foods are, are affecting nutrition as well as our food choices, Let's take a look at a case example. This is an example of a toddler's diet without food allergy. Typical diet, right? Eating three meals, three snacks, and drinking whole milk. When we look at the nutrient analysis of this diet, it's great. The toddler is meeting all of their nutritional needs for everything except vitamin D. Now the same toddler has now been diagnosed with food allergy to milk, egg, and peanut. Many foods and whole milk are no longer allowed. Without substitutions, the problem nutrients are calories, protein, fat, calcium, vitamin D, and iron, as well as many other micronutrients not listed on the slide. This nutrient analysis shows how the child is not meeting adequate nutrition. However, with education and guidance for substitutions and supplementation, in most situations, the child or adult is able to take in adequate nutrition. Many of the substitute foods are similar to the foods that the rest of the family is eating, but are instead prepared allergen-free. So when we look at the nutrient analysis with the substitutions, this shows how this child is able to meet all the nutrition goals except vitamin D. In this situation, the child would also need a multivitamin to help ensure adequate vitamin D intake. What's the role of the dietitian? The registered dietitian is your balancing bar to hold on to in helping you balance food allergies and nutrition intake. What is a pediatric dietitian? 
pediatric dietitian specializes in working with children who ensure adequate nutrition, monitor growth, and provide guidance with both oral and tube feedings. When searching out help, be sure to look for a registered dietitian, which means they have an RD after their name, which indicates that they are a board certified specialist in nutrition. Some dietitians refer to themselves as nutritionists. If you find a nutritionist, be sure to ask if they are also a registered dietitian. Many nutritionists are not board certified. What is the role of the dietitian? The role of the dietitian is to provide education for the avoidance of food allergens. This information is taking information from the allergist who has determined what food should be avoided. The dietitian's role is to help you learn to read the labels, identify foods and beverages that are appropriate substitutes, and review the nutrition risk for you or your child. With that information, they also should be monitoring growth and weight, providing guidance um, based on the results of those weight and growth indicators. They should be evaluating and monitoring intake, provide recommendations regarding multivitamin and mineral supplements, and they should also make recommendations for any nutrition labs that should be drawn depending on the situation. Now let's start talking about how to apply this information to daily life. What do you need to do to ensure adequate nutrition for yourself or your child with food allergy? First step, buy yourself a notebook. Make a list of what foods are going to be avoided and then make a list of what substitutes are for those foods. Keep things simple by using single ingredient foods until you master label reading. Keep in mind that you shouldn't give up, that you should read those labels every time you buy foods and keep the rule at home for rereading the label when you open the food item. That will help you ensure not to make a mistake. In order to ensure adequate nutrition, I've put together a checklist for you, a way to help you ensure that you're meeting the goals. So first, are you able to eat foods from all of the food groups? It's important to take a look at that, and if you're not, make sure you have appropriate substitutions. Drink water throughout the day. Eat three meals and one to two snacks per day. Drink an age-appropriate beverage with meals. We'll talk about what it means to have an age-appropriate beverage in just a few minutes. Next, we wanna make sure we set really appropriate nutrition goals. The example would be to eat breakfast every morning if we're at risk for skipping breakfast. No meals should be skipped. Prepare for challenges. Will you be in situations where you don't have allergen-free food available? If so, you need to have an action plan in place to ensure that you always have adequate nutrition available for you or your child. Include an age-appropriate multivitamin if needed and monitor weight and growth. The key factors to demonstrate adequate nutrition are being malnourished, having healthy growth, and having decreased or infrequent illness. Next, we can create a personalized meal plan. Each person who has food allergies needs to make sure that they personalize the goals for themselves. It's different for everyone. The key to a healthy, nutritionally complete diet is this plan. Part of the plan is to identify the age appropriate drink, and it's also to make a list of the allowed foods and breaking it out into the five food groups. With this information, you'll create a list of missing nutrients due to food allergies. Then you want to incorporate protein, prepare a list of foods and supplements to replace those miss, missing nutrients and incorporate protein at least three times a day. As you move forward with your personalized meal plan, this is a list of tips for trying to keep it as a healthy eating habit. 
So balancing the diet with allowed foods, and a balanced diet means consuming foods from all food groups, consuming foods in the right quantities, and making appropriate substitutions for any food groups not in the diet due to food allergy. For more information on serving sizes for all ages, you should go to www.myplate.gov. On their website, you are able to put in the age of the patient or child or adult to put together a feeding plan that provides you with information regarding serving sizes. Keep the plate in mind. We want to make sure that all five food groups are incorporated as much as possible or appropriate substitutes are made. And on the side, we must include fats, sugars, and sodium, but in many cases, we need to limit the quantities of those that are consumed. So we talked about the drink. How do we think about the drink? An age-appropriate beverage is key when cow's milk must be avoided. In some cases, you may need to give your child supplements when they're avoiding cow's milk. If he is at an age when a specialized milk-free formula is a large part of his daily diet, supplementation may not be needed. You may be able to use milk alternatives as an acceptable substitute if your child is over one year of age. Soy milk, fortified rice milk, mm -hmm. grain and nut milk, such as oat and almond milk, can be substituted if tolerated, but need to be fortified with additional nutrients. It is important, however, to review the nutrition information on the package to check the amount of protein, which should be 8 grams per 8 ounces per serving. Calcium fortified juices will provide additional calcium, but are not a good source of the other nutrients. So let's take a look at some of the alternatives. The grocery stores are flooded with these milk alternatives that make many different types of health claims. These beverages are off, also often enriched with calcium and vitamin D, which is very important. The products that are not enriched contain less than 100 milligrams of calcium and do not contain vitamin D. The age-appropriate beverage must provide a source of at least calcium and vitamin D, and if possible, we want it to provide fat and protein. When you look at soy milk, rice milk, and almond milk, the major difference is that soy milk provides some fat and protein where most of the other milk substitute products tend to be almost protein free and very low in fat and calories. Juice is not recommended in most situations. If a child or adult is severely restricted, we may use fruit juice, fortified fruit juice in some rare cases. Otherwise, we want to focus on using one of the other beverage supplements. Formulas are required if a child or adult is unable to meet their calorie, protein, vitamin, and mineral needs with their combination of food and beverages. There are several formulas to consider, and there is a category for soy, there's a category for hydrolyzed, which is partially broken down protein. And the third category is the amino acid-based formulas, which are the free amino acid-based formulas and are essentially allergen-free, but still provide protein, fat, and all the other nutrients. This is a comparison of the milk alternatives. Keep in mind that not all milks are created equal and should be carefully reviewed prior to the implementation into the diet. Most are inappropriate for children under two years of age due to providing the inadequate fat and protein. Calcium and vitamin D are two key nutrients that should be reviewed to ensure adequate nutrition. Remember that calcium needs change over time, and the older the child, the more difficult it is for them to meet their goals. This is the dietary reference intakes for all um, individuals regarding calcium and vitamin D. 
Most children and adults with food allergies should take a complete multivitamin. Complete means that it contains both vitamins and minerals, including iron. Avoid gummies, gummy multivitamins, as they are not complete despite the terms used on the labels. So if you're drinking 32 ounces of a complete formula or eating a wide variety of foods from all food groups, including dairy, you would not need a multivitamin. You might need a multivitamin if you're avoiding one major food group. You probably need a multivitamin if you're avoiding two major food groups. And you definitely need to take a multivitamin if avoiding three or more major food groups. Everyone needs a calcium and vitamin D supplement if they're avoiding milk and not drinking 32 ounces of enriched milk substitute or complete formula per day. Keep in mind that children, young children should not be drinking 32 ounces of an enriched milk substitute. In most cases, those children should be limited to 24 ounces. Therefore, many of these children will need additional calcium and vitamin D. This is just a few examples, not a complete list, of allergen-free multivitamins. Vitamins are changing on a daily basis, so just be sure to go to the store and read the labels and look for allergen-free information. All right, so let's pick up with, um, I'm going to review the do you need a calcium supplement again just to make sure everyone got that information. Um, how do you decide if you need a calcium supplement? First, you should add up the typical intake of calcium in 24 hours from both the beverage that's being consumed and the multivitamin. If you're not meeting the minimum goal for your age from those two items, you should give additional calcium to meet the minimum goal. Additional vitamin D will only be needed if you're not taking a complete multivitamin, as most multivitamins will contain at least 400 international units of vitamin D. Calcium tips. So keep in mind when you're taking calcium that it, if you're going to take more than 500 milligrams per day, you should divide it into one, two or more doses. Vitamin D and vitamin C improve the absorption of calcium. A high fiber diet decreases absorption and iron competes for the absorption. Calcium supplements are available in pills, chewables, candies, and liquid form, and they come in both calcium carbonate and calcium citrate. Be sure that if you're using calcium supplements, to read their labels carefully, and usually less than 100 milligrams are, of calcium is in a children's chewable multivitamin. Calcium is not in most liquid multivitamins. What about calcium from dark leafy greens? That's a super common question. Be careful. They are often, they, are, they do provide a source of calcium but typically not as much as you might think. So when you look at this list of uh, food items, all of these milligrams are based on adult portion sizes. So one serving of black beans provides 51 milligrams of calcium. If your needs in 24 hours is 1,300 milligrams, that would be a lot of black beans. So keep in mind that Calcium from these types of sources should just be considered as bonus calcium. Wheat. If wheat is one of the avoided foods, there are many, many alternatives. This list provides the name of the alternative in a brief description to help you better understand the, the use and the flavoring that each of those wheat alternatives may, be used, may impart. The second slide is a list of additional wheat alternatives and more information about how they can be used and again, the flavor and the taste that might be imparted. Finally, if you're also avoiding wheat, one of the key types of information you need is a replacement for all-purpose flour. There are many ideas for replacing wheat in recipes, and these are just a couple of the examples of wheat-free all-purpose flour mixtures that you can use for baking. 
If egg must be avoided, there are many, many alternatives, and the results will vary. And if you try one and you don't like the results, don't give up and try another. There are lots and lots of different ways to make products turn out, and it is really subjective as to what people think is good, tastes good, and um, looks good. So give some of these a try, and hopefully you'll be successful with some egg-free baking. There are also commercial egg replacers that a lot of people have success with. And tofu is a very common and accepted substitute for egg as well. You can see that you can replace one egg, for every egg, a fourth of a cup of soft tofu, tofu puree. A lot of people use this in egg, eat eggless egg salad, breakfast scrambles, and meatloaf. Just be sure to use plain tofu, not the seasoned or baked. Another task when replacing egg is finding something in place to use as a binder. So this is a list that gives you ideas to replace egg as a binder when making items such as drop cookies or breaded meat. What are some tips for finding substitutions? Take time to take inventory of the foods in your home first. Identify what foods are allergen-free. Then make a list of foods that need a substitution. Tips for helping you identify a substitution include looking for foods with shorter ingredient lists. Natural, organic, generic, or the store brand tend to have a shorter list to get through. That doesn't mean that the long lists aren't allowed. This just helps you be more successful initially when you're overwhelmed. Research brands and food labels online. If you see a brand of food items that tend to have, idea, have allergen free foods for you, take a look at their website. See if there are some other items that that company makes that might be helpful to you. Also, check some of the online shopping websites. This is a great way to navigate through lots of brands of food products very quickly to help you identify some things that you might like to try. Also, check out um, recipes. There are lots of recipes out there. So finding allergen-free foods can be very challenging. I know everyone that's listening has been overwhelmed by trying to figure out what to buy. The first step is to master reading labels. Make sure that you have the most up-to-date guidelines and information related to reading the food label. Next, there are many resources for assisting with locating and preparing allergen-free foods. With today's technology, there is easy access to thousands of recipes, the internet to research products and their ingredient statements, and even grocery, sh grocery shopping from your home using the online grocery stores. In addition to the internet tools, there are many more specialty stores opening up every day throughout the country. These stores are often very helpful as they will bring in items that are not available at the traditional grocery stores. However, always keep in mind that if you cook from scratch and focus on eating single ingredient foods, quickly the difficulty for ensuring allergen-free foods has drastically been reduced. I wanted to give you some ideas for snack ideas. These snacks if prepared appropriately, would be free of the top eight most common food allergens. Take a look at some cereal. Trail mix that you make from at home using your own choice of safe cereal, adding some dried fruits or pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds. This is a place you can have some fun and be creative. Make your own homemade granola or buy something from one of the specialty stores such as Enjoy Life. Snack bars. Fresh fruit or even the canned prepackaged fruit cups can be really easy and convenient and something you can travel with. Applesauce cups are great. Again, you can be transportable. Fresh vegetables with hummus or other dips made from allergen free spreads are a great snack. Raisins and other dried fruits, again, you can be creative with making a mix. 
There are lots of allergen-free cereal bar recipes online now that you can make your own specialty cereal bars. Rice crackers topped with some sort of topping, such as sunflower butter or a piece of turkey or chicken breast. Corn chips with salsa, popcorn, season the popcorn to have different flavors. We can look for pretzels and dip those pretzels in those allergen-free spreads or even taking a look for the all-natural meat sticks. This is just a list. Um, certainly it can be added to as there are a lot of different ideas for snacks. What are the basic guidelines for uh, nutrition and providing nutrition for the food allergic child or adult? First, we need to enjoy our food. We want to create and review that personalized meal plan. We need to work to incorporate fruits and vegetables into the daily routine with a goal of half the plate per meal. Make it easy for kids to choose healthy snacks. Have the things that you want them to eat available. Serve lean meats and other good sources of protein. Choose whole grain breads and cereals whenever possible. Limit fat intake unless you have a severely restricted situation in which you may be adding fat to your foods. Limit fast food and low nutrient snacks. Let's focus on the things that have lots of nutrition. Limit those sugary drinks if we don't want to fill up on liquids so that we aren't able to eat. A healthy eating checklist includes thinking the drink Offer foods from every food group, keeping it simple, having regular family meals, being a role model by eating the same foods as your child, avoiding battles over food, set those guidelines and limitations so that you're not having a debate at every meal. Cook more meals at home if at all possible and get your kids involved in the meal planning and in the food preparation. Also, we want to make sure that we limit the portion sizes as they change over time. We also want to limit sugar, salt, and fat unless it's nutritionally necessary to increase the fat intake. Eat slowly and discourage eating meals or snacks while doing something else, like watching TV and playing the iPad. We want to eat together around the table and have conversation. And we always need to work at drinking more water. Well, last but not least, we need to focus on the positives. Let's focus on the foods that are allowed versus the foods that must be avoided. Try not to use food to punish or reward your child. Get creative with some of the snacks and some of the fun things that we can do with food. Keep mealtime calm and positive and incorporate your allergen-free multivitamin and other nutritional supplements as needed. So in summary today, we've talked through how to carefully balance nutrition intake and food allergy. We need to incorporate all possible food groups. It's important to identify the most appropriate nutrition beverage. It's also important to maintain a healthy weight and appropriate weight gain growth if needed for children. We need to incorporate multivitamins and minerals as needed. And it's really important, if at all possible, to consult with a registered dietitian to help you navigate the nutritional needs. And most importantly, allow yourself to be creative. Thank you for this time today. Great. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. So we have lots of great questions that came in. Okay. I told Mary, I told her we might only get a few, but we've got, got, actually got plenty in. Um, we had a question uh, regarding too much soy for our children and their diets. Uh, can too much soy be detrimental to a child? That's, a, that's a, a great question and a very common question. And we're really fortunate that we have some information that helps us make some recommendations related to that topic. Um, the first point I always tell families is, is that we've actually had soy protein available in um, children's diets since really the early 1900s. Soy formula was used solely for infants 
um, from the beginning in the 1900s as the formulas were discovered. So children across the country for all these years have used soy products. So we've always recognized it as a good nutritional supplement. But more importantly, recently there's been two different studies that were completed monitoring children over a five-year time frame that also helped support that at this time we do not recognize any negative side effects of children having soy protein in their diet. So it's actually avoiding soy would put the child at more risk than it is um, if they are, I'm sorry, so if they're avoiding milk and you decide that you wanted to avoid soy because you're concerned about the problems related to soy, it actually puts them at greater nutritional risk and would be more detrimental to them to avoid soy all the time than it is to incorporate it into their diet. So the bottom line is all of the studies and the information that we have out there is that children thrive very well and there are no side, negative side effects that come from utilizing soy in the diet. The um, only position statement that's out there is for women with a certain type of breast cancer, um, and I apologize, I don't have that type of breast cancer available. Um, there is that category where the physicians will recommend that they should not take in large quantities of soy. So at this moment, that's the only position statement related to soy protein intake. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions regarding resources online. One, uh, how would someone go about finding an RD uh, in the area? And two, you talked about a food analysis. You did, the food analysis was great, this person said that you did. Um, but there are any tools out there for estimating what nutrients a person with multiple allergies may need added to their diet? Any kind of a calculator for that? Okay. So how to find an RD and then also any kind of analysis tools? Okay, good question. So we recognize that there is a, often a challenge in finding a dietitian for you to meet with depending on where you live and what your resources are. But one of the first places that you can look to see what's available in your area is the website www.eatright.org. That's the website for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. If you are, un the other option is to also make sure that you ask all of your medical providers, whether it's your allergist, your primary care physician, use your resources of the medical providers that you work with to try to also help identify who um, and where there are dietitians available in your area. Last but not least, um, through obviously FAIR, we're trying to do our best in keeping up as much information possible. Right now, we don't have a list of dietitians available in the area, but we are always trying to help support people where we can. But your first steps are to go to the eatright.org and talk to your primary care physicians in your local area. Secondly, analyzing your child's nutrition and intake. There are several nutrition um, free calculators for calculating um, calories and protein and micronutrients on the, um, the websites that you can Google and pull up. I don't have any specific ones that I would recommend. I would more importantly recommend that you talk through it with your physician and talk about what foods are being avoided. And if you have concerns, talk through it with the allergist and your primary care provider and ask what other resources you need to ensure what nutritionally sound um, information you can get. Um, doing the calculations for calories and that sort of thing yourself as a parent really shouldn't be necessary. We should really focus more on what we're offering and maintaining, um, whether they need a multivitamin or not, what the age-appropriate beverage is. Those are the bigger decisions that really need to be made. Great. Uh, we talked a little bit about those with multiple food allergies and um, the need to make sure there aren't any nutritional deficiencies that they have. How often should a child have their their blood actually tested for that, um, and who should do that? Oh, good uh, question. So we only need to draw blood if it's necessary. A lot of situations we can determine that the child is nutritionally sound and that they're not at risk, so there isn't any reason to draw labs. But it's between a dietitian and your allergist and your primary care provider to review the history for your child. 
what have they been drinking and eating for the past and what are they currently eating and drinking. And that helps identify where there might be risks. Certainly if the child is presenting with symptoms that we reviewed already on the slide, then for sure that would be a situation where they would want to draw labs. Great. And I have a, a couple of specific questions, but uh, uh, probably good for the rest of the group. We've had two people ask this question regarding coconut milk. Uh, specifically, would coconut milk be a good substitution for calcium in a child that's soy allergic uh, and also hates rice milk? <laughs> Absolutely. Coconut milk can be in included. And um, coconut milk obviously has nutrition that's more similar to the rice milk and the other beverages, so we need to use it cautiously, but it absolutely is often fortified with calcium and vitamin D and can play an appropriate role in the mix of foods that we're incorporating into the food allergic child's diet. For parents or families or adults looking to increase caloric intake because of limited diets, uh, any oils that you would suggest that you could add to food just to increase calories? Yes, so if we increase calories, there's two ways to do it. It's with fat and oil and it's with sugar. So if we're talking about the topic of oil, any oil has the same caloric density. If you look at canola oil, olive oil, um, sunflower seed oil, they're all going to be very similar in the amount of calories. So the difference is, is how saturated or unsaturated the oil is or how it imparts flavor. So if we're trying to sneak in more calories into a food and you don't want it to have flavor, canola oil is one of the best ones to use because you can mix it into something that essentially makes it so it disappears. If you're preparing something that's more along the lines of Italian food where olive oil would be appropriate, we want to incorporate olive oil. It's a healthy oil, it's more unsaturated, and can help make the food taste even better. So all oils fit, just apply them appropriately. If you're an adult that's um, in a situation of dealing with more heart disease types of things, then you want to take a look at more of the unsaturated oils versus saturated. Thank you very much. Uh, you talked a lot about chewable vitamins, <clears throat> multivitamins for uh, children. We had some folks ask questions about uh, if they have concerns about maybe hidden allergens in there and like natural flavors and whatnot. Uh, any that you would recommend, in full disclosure, we have no vitamin sponsors, so <laughs> whatever she says now is completely <laughs> biased. Um, and uh, if not, how would you go about, would you recommend someone go about finding out what might be in there? I am a full believer in contacting the manufacturer to find out more information. And um, we really do, uh, vitamins and minerals are FDA regulated, um, but we need, if you're questioning something about the vitamin, contacting the manufacturer directly to get more information is the best avenue. There are certainly several companies now that are promoting their allergen-free type of multivitamins. So if you're not able to find something over the counter that you're comfortable with, utilizing one of those companies that's really promoting their allergen-free product would be another option. I uh, have a question, um, and by the way, we do have our college food allergy program, so we will soon, very soon, have some dining guidelines out for colleges managing uh, diets on campus. Uh, but we have uh, a question regarding, um, you know, for a mom who's just sent her kid away to college and they're not used to managing on their own and they walk into a dining hall and not really feeling that there's anything for them to eat. Uh, any suggestions for those students or for the parents for trying to to take that next step and take over the reins managing their own diets. Yeah, that's a huge step and it's a very challenging situation. And I think we all most importantly need to recognize that any college student going off to college, the number one thing that happens is all college students really take in poor nutrition. And that we um, need to pre-plan and make some goals and set, talk together as a parent and a child to identify what are our goals as you go off to college, what are some things that we can do together to help you be more successful, but we don't want to get too worried about the days not being perfect um, while they're in college, especially that first year, as we have to let it unfold a little bit, um, but I would sit down together as the parent and the college student 
make a plan for what specialty stores are nearby campus, what are the options within the college dorm room for a refrigerator or storage space for some of the convenience foods. Now, what is the key beverage that that child should be drinking and how do we make it readily available? And touching bases with the college um, and their food service department to find out what are the items and things that they can safely offer for the college student. It's really communicating with the college and working with them to try to bridge all the gaps. Um, but remember, they're truly a freshman in college, and so it's not ever going to go perfectly. So one more question, and this kind of relates to a great session that you did at our national conference this year uh, with Linda Herbert from DC Children's Hospital. But someone is asking a question about, is there a correlation that you've seen uh, between multiple serious food allergies and eating disorders like anorexia? Yeah, that is a great question. And I don't know that we have any hardcore studies yet to support exactly what's happening, but we all recognize that avoiding foods and the focus on food and the fear of making a mistake or the fear of accidental exposure absolutely can cause um, changes in our related to eating. And that's why the last few slides talks about normalizing your feeding and eating as much as possible. The more you can have family meals, the more you can focus on the positive, what's allowed in the diet versus what's avoided. The more pre-planning you do for special events and special occasions really downplays the focus on the food and helps that child realize that I can lead a normal life even though I have all of these food allergies. But if you're concerned about the emotional health of your child or an adult family member that has food allergies, absolutely get the resource of an expert in, uh, um, resource in asking for a psychologist to get involved and get involved early. Don't wait until it's a really big problem. If you have suspicions of challenges, be sure to ask for help. Great. Thank you so, so much, Mary Beth. Really, really great responses. Um, Really great comments, too, so thanking you. Great. Everyone thanks you, including us, of course.